In this section, we're going to talk about inferential statistics. Specifically, in this section, we're going to take a look at the idea of hypothesis testing and probability. After that, we're going to talk about the different types of statistical outcomes that can occur. In this video, we're going to talk about hypothesis testing and probability. Specifically, in this video, we're going to take a look at hypotheses, we're then going to talk about probability, and then finally, we're going to talk about replication. Descriptive statistics describe the data in a sample through the use of a number of summary procedures and statistics. For example, we might have collected customer satisfaction data on a subset of our customers, and we were able to determine that the average satisfaction for our customers was 3.5 on a five point scale. Sometimes, however, you want to take this information a step further. For example, you may want to determine if there's a difference in satisfaction between customers that bought product A with a satisfaction level of 3.6 compared to customers that bought product B with a satisfaction level of 3.3. Yes, the numbers are not exactly the same, but are they really different or are the differences due to random variation? This is the type of question that inferential statistics can answer. Inferential statistics allow you to infer the results from the sample on which you have data to the population which the sample represents. Understanding how to make inferences from a sample to a population is the basis for inferential statistics. This allows you to reach conclusions about the population without the need to study every single individual. Hypothesis testing allows researchers to develop hypotheses which are then assessed to determine the probability or the likelihood of those findings. Now, whenever you wish to make an inference about a population from a sample, you must test a specific hypothesis. It's common practice to state two hypotheses. You have a null hypothesis and you have the alternative or the research hypothesis. The null hypothesis is the one that generally says that there is no effect or no difference. For example, you might be looking at the differences in mean income between males and females, but the null hypothesis you are testing is that there is no difference between the groups. For the satisfaction example, the null hypothesis would be that there are no differences in satisfaction between customers that bought product A and customers that bought product B. In other words, the differences that we saw in those numbers, the difference between 3.6 and 3.3, those are just variations that were due just chance. The alternative hypothesis is generally, although not exclusively, the one researchers are generally interested in. In this example, you might hypothesize that the mean income between males and females is different. Or going back to the satisfaction example, the alternative hypothesis would be that there are differences in satisfaction between customers that bought product A and product B. So in other words, those differences at 3.6 and 3.3, those differences are real. Now, in statistics, we never know anything for certain because we are dealing with samples rather than populations. Therefore, we always have to work with probabilities. The way hypotheses are assessed is by calculating the probability or the likelihood of finding our result. A probability value, which can range from zero to one, corresponding to 0% to 100% in terms of percentages, can be defined as the mathematical likelihood of a given event occurring. And as such, you can use these values to assess whether the likelihood of any differences you have found are the results of random chance. So at this point, we've talked about the idea of hypotheses and probabilities, but how do these two ideas interact? Let me give you an example. Suppose I wanna know who will win the Super Bowl. I ask a fellow statistician and he tells me that he's built a predictive model and he knows which team is going to win. He says team A is going to win. And so my next question is, how confident are you in that prediction? And my friend tells me I'm 50% confident. Now, are you going to trust that prediction? Of course not, because there are only two possible outcomes and 50% is just random chance. So if I ask, let's say another statistician, and he tells me that he has a prediction, he's built a predictive model, he thinks team A is going to win, and he's 75% confident in his prediction. Are you going to trust this prediction now? Well, now you start to think about it a little bit. You have a 75% chance of being right, and a 25% chance of being wrong. Now, let's say that you decide that 25% chance of being wrong is too high. So you ask another fellow statistician, and she tells me that she's built a predictive model, and she knows that team A will win, and she is 90% confident in her prediction. Are you going to trust this prediction? 
now you have a 90% chance of being right and only a 10% chance of being wrong. That is the way that statistics work. We have two hypotheses and we want to be sure of our conclusions. So having formally stated the hypotheses, we then have to select a criterion for acceptance or rejection of the null hypothesis. With probability tests like the chi-square test or a t-test or regression or correlation or any one of these different statistical tests, you are testing the likelihood that a statistic of the magnitude that you obtained or greater would have occurred by chance assuming that the null hypothesis is true. Now remember, you always assess probability of the null hypothesis is true. And again, the null hypothesis is the hypothesis that states that there is no difference or relationship between the variables or uh, the groups. In other words, you only wish to reject the null hypothesis when you can say that the results would have been extremely unlikely under the conditions set by the null hypothesis. In this case, if you can reject the null hypothesis, you have found support for the research hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis. Now, it's worth noting that this does not prove the alternative hypothesis beyond any kind of doubt, but it tells you that the null hypothesis is unlikely to be true. So what criterion do we use? Well, the criterion that we typically use, or alpha level or significance level, is typically set at 0.05 or 5% indicating that a statistic of the size that we obtained would only be likely to occur on 5% of the occasions. So 1 in 20, for example. Now, this also means that by choosing a 5% criterion, you are accepting that you will make a mistake in rejecting the null hypothesis 5% of the time. But 5% of the time is typically something that we can live with. Now, in statistics, because we are working with a sample, but we really want to infer res our results over to a population, we work with hypotheses and probabilities and things like that. And the reason we do that is because we want to make sure that what we found is something that is true. We have a real effect. In data mining, we can take that same approach, but a different approach that is, is typically used in data mining because we don't follow a lot of the traditional assumptions of statistics is that we use replication instead. And so what we often do in a data mining project is that we have two different data sets. We have a training data set and we have a testing data set. We end up building our model on a training data set. And then once we've done that, we take those results of that model and apply it to a testing data set to see if we find similar results. So again, data mining and statistics take a slightly different approach here. Statistics is going to use the idea of probability and hypothesis testing, whereas data mining typically uses the approach of replication. So they have two separate samples, and we're seeing if we find the same result in both samples.